left of the angel and ate it. It was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it in my stomach was made bitter. I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Lauren. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. So preparing for this message, I was looking over my notes, and just then, as I'm looking at my notes, I'm kind of doodling online. I see uh, news break out of Israel, and so I get on my Twitter news feed and just kind of follow along with probably with a lot of what you were doing. Uh, and it's just interesting in light of the book of Revelation being God, the king of all things, and how he's going to restore all things. And we're facing another reality that this is not the kingdom fully realized yet. So uh, the thought I had is everyone is narrating the situation in Israel right now. It's true of everything, but especially true of something so vital as the Middle East and Israel and Islamic relations and terrorist attacks. And so what I want to do in this moment, just to remind ourselves of who we serve and who the king is, is I want to read a psalm over us, and then I want to pray for Israel and the attacks they're under now. So Psalm 2, would you just bow your heads, close your eyes while I read this over us? Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Father, this is our prayer, that kings would be wise and fear you above all else. So God, as we encounter another season of news of kings foolishly setting themselves up, and militant groups foolishly setting themselves up. And just the reality that we still live in a world where you have not fully done away with evil. And we're still waiting for that day. So God, I pray for Israel. I pray that this would end. I pray that you would be glorified. I pray that people would turn to you in this season. And God, as a church family, I pray that we would always come back to your word for confidence, for assurance, and for the path forward in a world that is continually showing its true colors. Lord, we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, now we get to dive into uh, interesting day, child dedication and the judgment trumpets of revelation, but that's how the Lord lined this up. I'm excited for this. It reminds me uh, of one of the most famous prayers people have prayed forever. It's this. You got it there? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is a beautiful little statement. We have this shirt in Phoenix as it is in heaven. My wife said, all right, you wear that thing too much. This is the fifth football practice in a row that you've been wearing that same shirt, but it's black and it's soft. And here's the other thing. Everybody loves that shirt. Christians look at it and they say, that's a great shirt. Non-Christian, secular to the end of days, look at that shirt and say, that's a great shirt because it rolls off the tongue. One guy once said about the statement, love your neighbor as you love yourself. It rolls off the tongue so beautifully. Yet trying to live that truth out in your life is like walking through a landmine. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. How is the Middle East going to fix? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's so beautiful and poetic and easy to say. But to live it out is like walking through a landmine. Similarly, your kingdom come. Christians have prayed this for thousands of years now. Your will be done on earth as it is 
in heaven. What exactly are we praying when we pray that? That the kingdoms of this place would be pushed out and God's kingdom would come down. That is a violent prayer we are praying. That's not a rosy prayer. That's intense. And just so you know, what we're going to walk through in this is God showing that prayer come to fruition in the life here on earth. If you will, flip over to Revelation 11, chapter 15. I'll walk back and walk us through the trumpets. But here's how this section ends. Revelation 8 through 11. With these trumpet sounds of judgment. 11 verse 15 says this. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. What has happened? The prayer, the Lord's prayer that people have been praying has finally been fully realized in this section. That's what we're going to get a picture of. How did we get there? Lauren just read a little bit, but flip back, flip back to Revelation 10. I want you to read the depiction that John gives for what it's like to see the kingdom of God become the kingdom of earth. So Revelation chapter 10, verse 9, this is the end of what she read. So I went to the angel, and I told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And then I was told, you must again prophesy about many people's nations, language, and kings. What is that about? Remember, the scrolls in the book of Revelation are God's unfolding plan of how he's fulfilling this plan of redemption. And this angel gives John this little scroll, and he says it's going to be sweet, but as soon as you digest it, it's going to be bitter. What's he talking about? The judgments that were about to unfold. The word of God. That prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's sweet. It's easy to say. In Phoenix, as it is in heaven, I'll put that on a shirt all day. How does God's kingdom come to earth? John takes and eat, and it's bitter. Because the book of Revelation shows how that's actually going to happen. It's not going to happen through platitudes. It's not going to happen through media personalities getting on the news and telling us to have peace in the Middle East. It's not going to happen through your good works bringing in the kingdom of God. It's going to happen through a few things. And in this section, Revelation 8 through 11, we see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And we're going to see three things. Here's the three things. If you're a note taker, it's going to come by judgment, which is the biggest portion of this, by witness, and also by grace. By judgment, by witness, and by grace. So here's what I do. I know we've prayed a lot, but I want to pause and just like prepare to digest that which will be bitter as we digest it. So let's take a second, bow our heads, and pray. God, thank you for revelation and ultimate reality. And thank you for this little image that John gives us of the sweetness at first and the bitterness as it goes down. So I pray as your church, we would sit, we would get past the sweetness of the good news, and we'd sit with the bitterness of how this all has to go down for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. So give us a bigger appetite for the things of you, God. And fill us by your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here's the first one. Your kingdom must come by judgment. Your kingdom must come by judgment. A few weeks ago, I arrogantly said, man, Revelation is a lot easier than I expected it to be. And now it's not as easy as I was hoping it would be. Because we're in this section where all these judgments are happening. Just to give you, I'm going to give us like a 30,000 foot Three minute over you real, real quick. Here's what we're in the middle of. This judgment by God being revealed through these seven seals. That was Xavier last week. I heard he did a great job. I watched him. He did a great job. Seven trumpets this week. And then in a few weeks, these seven bowls. But they're all the same thing. They're these unfolding plans of God being shown through these crazy 
crazy images that the Apostle John sees and then writes down for our benefit. Remember the seven seals. A seal is open, something unfolds. A seal is open, something unfolds. A seal is a... But just to show you, like, they're all basically telling the same story from a different angle. The seal, the trumpet, the bowls. Because they all have the same pattern. They all end very victoriously. Xavier ended at the end of chapter 7. Chapter 8 opens up with the seventh seal being opened, and there was silence on earth for 30 minutes. It's a way to say, peace, shalom. The world is as it should be. It's back. There's no more angst in the air. There's peaceful worship of the king. And then we get to these trumpets, and you get to the end. The seventh trumpet is blown. It's Revelation chapter 7, and it ends with the words I already read. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And then the elders sing a song. We give thanks to you, Lord God, who was and is, for you have taken your great power, and you have begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged and your rewarding of your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Seventh trumpet is victorious. And then the bulls, you get to the end, and it says this. This is so beautiful because it echoes the cross. Seventh bull, and it says, it is done. It's like Jesus on the cross. It is finished. So there's these very intense judgments all capped off with this like triumphant, victorious moment. And they all have the same pattern. This, you can go and read in your own time. We're going to get to it. But they all have six. So you got six things happening, and then there's like an interlude. It's like a break in the action. So it's seal, 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 break. Last week, Xavier's break, the interlude was the church. John looked, and he saw a multi-ethnic reality. Every tribe, tongue, nation, worshiping before the throne, saying, salvation belongs to our Lord and our God who sits on the throne forever and ever. That's the interlude. It's sort of like a little beautiful poetic picture of the church as judgment is unfolding. And then you get to the seventh seal, and it's peace. Shalom is back. Same week this week, we got a little interlude. This interlude might be the weirdest. And if you're like a left-behind book lover, you're going to like disagree with a lot of what I say, but that's fine. But here's what happens. In this little interlude, you got these six trumpets. Trumpet, 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 little break, and then these two witnesses are introduced. And they're described very graphically, and what's done to them is graphic. And then they rise victorious. And then we go to the seventh trumpet, and they sing, the kingdom has finally come. Same thing with the bulls. Say, a little interlude, angels sing, a little picture of the church, it is done. But that does not get away from the fact that all sounds very good, but when you actually read the text, this is intense. Just a reminder, this is apocalyptic literature. It's, it's meant to be graphically uh, imaginative so that you would have an image in your head. What's the image for? Just for entertainment, like a comic book? No, what God's trying to do is give the Christians on the ground back then and us in this room graphic images to describe how heaven sees what's happening on earth so we don't get like tunnel vision and think man this is really bad god's trying to lift our imagination and say hey i've got this i sit on the throne don't you worry this is the imagery so what we're about to walk through is graphic apocalyptic literature i just want to read the first trumpet and then i'll give you the summary of all the others but the first trumpet is in revelation chapter 8 Revelation chapter 8, verse 6 through verse 7. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up. And a third of the trees were burned up. And all the green grass was burned up. So a third of the earth is destroyed. First trumpet. What are we reading here? The bitterness of how God's kingdom comes to earth. It comes through judgment. If there's kingdoms on this earth that are not God's, the way he gets rid of them is through judgment. And don't think kingdom, don't think Iran, Russia, America, 
Think that, but also think every human heart in this room has an allegiance to some king. And the kings of this earth will be judged. And here's the first judgment. And then as you walk through this, you can read it in your own time if you're, you're bored at all. But the second trumpet is this. Now a third of the sea becomes blood. So the land is burned up, a third of it. And now a third of the sea becomes blood as the second trumpet is blown. Third trumpet. Now a third of the fresh waters are ruined. What seems like a comet comes from earth, they call it wormwood, and all the rivers and lakes and drinking water, a third of it is affected. And then a fourth trumpet, and now looks up at the stars in the sky, and a third of it goes dark. It's like the lights are all turned off in the stars and the planets. And there's a third more darkness in the world, and a third of the day now is dark. And the angel steps in and says, the woes are about to begin, as a way to say, that was just the first chapter. And then he goes into even more intense stuff. The fifth trumpet is blown, and demonic activity is released on earth. God the king is in control. All evil is on a leash that God holds, but it's released. And just so you know how bad it gets, Revelation chapter 9, verse 6, let's read it together. Here's how humanity sitting under the judgment of God reacts. And in those days, people will seek death, and they will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. It gets so bad that people would rather die, and yet somehow they can't escape to the reprieve that is death. One more trumpet. Before the final. Sixth trumpet. Now it talks about these four angels that are bound. Again, more demonic activity. These four angels are released. Let's just read it together. Chapter 9, verse 18 and 19. And now by these plagues, a third of mankind was killed. By the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. All demonic activity. Verse 19, for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. And then we go into the interlude. What is happening? Here's a few ways to read. Seals, trumpets, bulls. Some people that I respect a lot would say all those are describing first century trials and tribulations under the Roman rule that the Christians would experience. As Nero and others sort of, it's a picture of Roman persecution and all that's going on then. That's one option. The other option, which became popular decades ago, and especially in America, dispensationalism, talks about a rapture, it's what the whole left behind is, pictures these as more like dominoes. Seal one, seal two, seal three, seal four, trumpet, 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 bowl, 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 bowl. It's like a literal, chronological fleshing out of the tribulation and all that's going to happen. That's an option as well. It's not the one I think is most faithful to Scripture, but it's been taught a lot. I think it's more like Russian dolls. You open it, and there's another, another, another. When you're looking at the seal judgments or the trumpet judgments or the bowl judgments, it's all just a different angle of the same thing, the unleashing of God's judgment on this earth for its rebellion to him as the true king. And we can't pinpoint everything and say, and this is this, this. It's more God is fierce in his pursuit of justice. And how is justice brought about? Judgment. And what we're getting through all these layers of pictures is a picture of God's judgment being fleshed out on earth in its rebellion. And can we just, like, pause and say, this is intense. And some of you, like, brought a friend. Like, I should have read ahead in the Bible. <laughs> but it gets to the heart of two very serious Christian and non-Christian issues with God. I'll call one the global one, the other one the personal one. The global one would be suffering. You believe in a good God, Josh, Yes. He loves me unconditionally. He's only good to me. Then why is there so much suffering? Part of the Christian answer, if not the biggest part, is the judgment of God being unleashed on earth. It's what Romans 1 says. There's like a passive element of God letting us have our way the way we want it and then ending up with the results in front of us. 
and there's an active where God steps in and also judges. But again, that doesn't sit well, especially in our cultural moment. There's a global suffering. The other one is this, and this is the question gets asked a lot. If God is so good, why does he send anyone to hell? It's the personal one. You believe God's good, yes, and gracious and forgiving, yes. Why does he send anyone to hell? And can I just say, both those questions sort of come from the same sort of baseline assumptions that I think a lot of us by nature just walk around with. And I'm going to say it, and it's going to maybe stick on you, but I'm going to say it. We assume we're more gracious and merciful than the Lord. Because if I was God, I would do it this way. Well, would you send people to hell? I don't want to get into the details, but I would be more gracious, I think. And I, I thought long and hard about this, and here's the reality. At least for me, you might be better than me, but I don't think you are. <laughs> we could just follow you around the GoPro for seven days, five days, three days, before we saw the moment where, oh, your grace and your mercy aren't as vast and deep and impressive as you think they are. You couldn't get out of your house this morning without losing it on your spouse, who's at the top of your favorite people list, let alone that turd of a neighbor you got to drive past every morning. <laughs> so John says this, it's sweet like honey, but as you digest it, there's a bitterness. And I don't want us as a church to run out because it's bitter. We got to sit with the judgment of God is necessary for the kingdom of God to become the kingdom of the earth. And that's what we're seeing in this. But in the midst of that judgment, what is God wanting? What does he want? Peter says it this way. It's not on the screen. I'll read it. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So as judgment is being unleashed, as there's famine, as the economy takes a turn towards whatever it takes a turn toward, as Israel deals with everything, as the world is hell on earth in a lot of ways. God is not wishing that any would die without turning to him. Repentance simply means turn. It's the first words out of Jesus' mouth. Hey, the Messiah is here. What's he going to say? The gospel say, he says, repent. The kingdom is here. Now, does that happen as God's judgment unfolds? Revelation chapter 9, verse 20. This is how it's described. As a third of the earth, a third of the skies, a third of the waters, a third of humanity is killed by plagues and demonic activity. Verse 20 and 21 of chapter 9. Now, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. God brought some of you into this place to hear that line right there, that the thing that's needed in your life still is not an amount of money, a health update, it's repentance. It's turning from your idols of money and power and prestige. Turn. But we go to the book of Revelation, and the bitterness is, even if God unleashed judgment here in Phoenix that rivaled the imagery of Revelation, the human heart is so hard that they can see that and still refuse to bow to the king. That is so sad, and the truth of every human heart, apart from the grace of Jesus, softening it towards him. The first way that God's kingdom come is by judgment. Well, how are people actually going to come into this kingdom? That's the second one. Our kingdom also comes, God's kingdom comes by witness. What do I mean by that? Well, if they don't get saved by watching people die and the earth get burned up and the stars go black, what is going to be the thing that turns their head towards Jesus? Revelation chapter 11 actually gives us a beautiful, although be it weird, picture of how this happens. 
we're introduced to these two witnesses. I want to read chapter 11, verse 4, down through verse 10. So now John sees, so now there's, this is the break between six and seven trumpets. And he turns and he sees two witnesses. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Verse 7. And when they finish their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them, conquer them, kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies, refuse to let them be placed in a tomb, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because the two prophets had been tormented, had tormented to those who dwell on the earth. But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Wow. I'm going to earn my entire year's salary explaining this. <laughs> what is happening? There's a few options. One, which I think has merit, but I, it's describing the two witnesses are describing sort of the, the whole flow of prophecy, of prophets in God's economy. Like even the language use. They could pray and stop rain from coming. That's Elijah. Elijah was a man full of faith. He prayed, said, God, don't let it rain, and God stopped the rain. Moses, also a man of faith, turned water into blood. Both of those are referenced here. So it's a, God's ongoing testimony through, his, testimony through his prophets, specifically looking at Elijah and Moses. That's one. The dispensational, so the ones that would believe in a rapture in seven years, they think these are literal people, maybe Elijah and Moses coming back to this earth where this literal thing is going to happen. They're going to be standing there. They're going to be killed. They're going to be left on the streets, and people are going to look at them, mock them, celebrate, throw parties, give presents to one another, laughing that God's witnesses are now dead. Or I take this to be the witness being the picture of the church. Where do I come up with that? Am I just making it up? Verse 4 is where I get a lot of it. Now, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Lampstands in the book of Revelation refers to churches. The seven churches, they're my lampstands. God says, I can remove that lampstand if you're unfaithful. But the lampstand is church language. Well, why not seven here? Well, I think it's a picture of God saying, not every church that claims to be a church is a church, if we're talking about heaven's perspective on this. You could have a sign on any building and call it whatever you want, and God could walk past it a million times, never once recognizing it as a church. So I think that's another way. But here's the, the, the thing a lot of commentaries say. Throughout the Bible, two witnesses are always required to valid validate a testimony. And here we have two lampstands, two witnesses. So I think what John is doing is giving this graphic image of these two witnesses graphically murdered and killed and mocked in the streets and then miraculously raised on three days to give us a picture as the church. This is our role in this world as judgment is unfolding around us. You're like, I did not sign up for that, nor did I. I thought I was signing up for the forgiveness of sins and heaven. And Jesus says, yeah, but you got a lifetime of following me, the way of the cross. We'll get to that. But I think that's what this is a picture of. But just to give us some hope, how are these people described? I want to look at the most graphic image here, verse 5, and see how John sees an image of these two witnesses. Verse 5 says this, And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. Pause right there. Is this literally what's going to happen? Fire coming from the mouth of these witnesses. Some would take it as yes. 
I think here's what John, the image is trying to do that John is relaying to us. They see an image. These people have fire coming out and consuming the people that are attacking them. Who is he writing to? First century Christians and us in this room. Under persecution back then and under varying levels of persecution now. What does it feel like when you're being persecuted simply for being a Christian? Lonely, isolating, depressing, despairing. This is not what I signed up for. Think of Christians right now in Israel and the Middle East. This is terrible. And from heaven's perspective, how does God see that happening? The image he gives is the witnesses. Hey, fire will come from your mouth. And they will be killed in the way that they are killing you. Do not worry. Just stay faithful. And verse 7 gives a picture of what faithfulness for us as the church is. Verse 7. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit... Where is it? Will make war on them, conquer them, and kill them. When they have finished their testimony. Think of that. Everyone's trying to hurt these Christians. And the Apostle John says, When they're done with the work God has placed before them, then I'll let the harm come upon them that the world wants to bring upon them. But not until they're finished with their testimony. Testimony is the word witness. We all have a job to do. We were just talking about this with our boys, talking about purpose in this world. Ephesians 2.10, we are God's workmanship. We are his poetry. God wrote a poem with my life, and that poem is not over until God says it's over. It does not matter what the world is doing to me or to others or to Christians in general. My story is over when God says, done. They will finish their testimonies, and then they'll be killed and mocked. Is this literally happening? No, it's a picture of faithfulness in the church. It is faithful witnessing in a world that is antagonistic, violent, and beating us up in all sorts of ways. Whether it's just simple mockery that you are the weird Christian. Like some of you are the Christian, the minority in your home because you're a Christian. I think all of us are the minority in our neighborhood for the most part. Most of our neighbors, if we look at stats are not of the same mind, the same faith. And if you live in an all-Christian neighborhood, that's weird. (laughs) And our job, like with a few exceptions, most of our jobs put us before the face of a world that maybe isn't going to kill us and leave us in the streets and throw parties over that. But that essence of living in a world that is against Jesus is on us. But here's the beauty of this passage. Judgment on the earth. One, two, three, four, five, six trumpets of judgment. They look at that and they do not repent. Bring on the scene the two witnesses, my faithful church, following the way of the Lamb in this day and age. What happens when they come on the scene? Go to chapter 11, verse 13. This is what's said of the results brought by the faithful witness of God's people. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Behold, the second woe is past, the third is soon to come. What happens in this scene? They were terrified, the judgments were terrifying. Death and destruction is terrifying. There was this terrifying feeling inside them. What did they do as they saw the witnesses faithfully follow the way of Jesus? They gave glory to the God of heaven. Praise God. That is beautiful, but for us, just so you know what that means. Our call in this world is to be faithful witnesses through messy, complicated, violent persecution. In whatever way, shape it comes. We're to stand like the witnesses and finish our testimony, finish lives well-lived, proclaiming that Jesus is king. He is the only way, and he is the only way to salvation, and we will die and meet him one day. There is no roundabout around this. How are the non-Christians in your life going to meet Jesus? Jesus says, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. It's through Jesus. But how are they going to interact, intersect with the life of Jesus? Revelation would say this, through your faithful and my faithful and our faithful witnessing in a loud, anti-Christian world. None of us, can I just be honest, none of us signed up for that. I got saved as an 18-year-old because my girlfriend broke up with me, and I knew I had some sin in my life. I can't fix the girlfriend, God said, but I'll fix your sin, and you're saved. All of us that know Jesus met him, and we got these benefits. But now, Revelation reminds us we have a path before us to walk as faithful witnesses. But this book actually ends with more grace and beauty than I expected. It takes us to the final one. Our kingdom, his kingdom, is going to come finally by grace. Grace is a very universal word. It's a Jesus word, though. What does grace mean? It's God treats me better than I deserve. What did I deserve as a sinful, rebellious, un- impure, thieving? I'm trying to think of all my 17 year old sins, lots of them. When I met Jesus at the end of my 17 years of life, I had a bucket full of sin that was gross. What should he have done? He never should have taken a step forward towards me because I had yet to take a step towards him in my life up to that point. But he comes in his grace and he walks towards me and he restores me and he gives me forgiveness. And he's done the same to some of you. Now what, as we look at the book of Revelation, here's the fear and here's the danger is you lose sight of grace as you get caught up in the storm that is this imagery. It's like, gosh, God is doing crazy things. Angels and floods and plagues and fires and stars going out. Is there still grace as God's judgment is being unloaded on earth? And I would say absolutely 100%. If you will, read with me the verse we already read, but I want to read it through a Jewish lens. Revelation chapter 11, verse 13 and 14 says this. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The final trumpet. A tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed. We hear that, and we don't make much of the numbers. I get that. But an early Jewish reader would hear that and think, I've heard that before. I've heard of tens, and I've heard of 7,000. That, that exact number I've heard before. Where have I heard that before? During judgment in the past in God's story. Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to destroy this city for its sexual immorality. Abraham steps in. Please, please, please. Would you not? And God says, I will relent if you can find ten righteous. And he goes and he does not find ten righteous and God destroys the city. And now in this scene we see a tenth being destroyed. But nine tenths being restored and giving glory to God. And the other story, 7,000. Where have I heard 7,000? Elijah, the prophet, who stood in a time of judgment on the people of God primarily, but also the surrounding nations. And he's having this pity party. He kind of goes off and he's modern-day journaling, like, God, I'm the only one that's faithful. Some of us feel like that. I'm the only faithful Christian. I'm the only one striving for sexual purity in this day. I am the only one in my family that's really trying to do this. That's how Elijah felt. And God says, just so you know, There are still 7,000 people who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You're not alone. There's 7,000 with you. And then you get to the book of Revelation, and 7,000 are killed, but the remaining mass are the ones that turn their faces towards the king and give glory. One commentary wants us to see this. He says this, Do not mistake the powerful impact of the symbolism in that verse. When God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, he might have spared it if 10 righteous persons were found. Now, however, only one-tenth of the wicked city is to fall and nine-tenths is to be saved. That's grace. When God was judging Israel through Elijah, only 7,000 were left who had not bowed the knee to the pagan god Baal. Now, however, it is only 7,000 who are killed and the great majority will be rescued. That's grace. Suddenly, out of the smoke and fire of these chapters, a vision is emerging, a vision of the creator God as the God of mercy, grieving over rebellion and corruption of the world, but determined to rescue and restore it, and doing so through the faithful, this is the 
crux. Death of the Lamb, Jesus' first death, and now all the deaths we die, now through the faithful death of the Lamb's prophetic followers, the church. Christians, millions of people have prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And now Revelation shows us how that happened. And it happens through judgment. It happens through our faithful witness. And it happens simply because God is so gracious with us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. God, help us to sit with the, the imagery of John eating a scroll that's sweet and bitter as soon as it is digested. This book of Revelation is hard to digest, partially because of the language and the images, but largely because we just don't sit in a world that talks about judgment or your holiness. We just don't see world, this world from a heavenly perspective as often as we should. So I, gotta, I pray that once again, we would have a little bit more of a heavenly image of what's happening in this world. And in light of that, our role to play as your faithful followers, as we follow the lamb who was slain. God be with us. Amen.